Well, hey everyone, I'm so excited to be here. It's Carla Rieger and welcome to this session. It's called How to Pitch Your Ideas So People Listen, Secrets to Being a Master of Storytelling in Business to Inspire and Motivate People to Action. So imagine this, a large oval mahogany board table with 10 managers comfortably seated in ergonomic chairs. At one end of the board table, there's a screen and one by one, each of the managers takes turns giving a presentation. They present their update and budget needs to the boss and do so by facing the screen, not the group and reading every single word from the slide. Throughout their presentation, they do not remove their eyes from the screen once and make no attempt to engage with the listeners. At the end of each presentation, the presenter asks if there's any questions, usually only one from the boss. It's the same question he asks each presenter. It's about when their particular part of the project will be ready. Clearly the boss wasn't really listening and secretly many others in the room are texting under the table, bored to death. Then, Ryan steps up. He addresses the group, not the screen. His slides contain a few words and many images to describe the user experience of their company's product. Ryan tells the story of talking to each of them, what was working, what didn't, and then he proposes two solutions for fixing what didn't work and the budget necessary to do that. No one except Ryan ends up getting the budget they asked for. So this event just happened last month. I was in the room. It's so very common to see that. So I'd be interested, type yes into the chat if you have seen people give presentations like that, like they're talking to the screen mostly using just facts and concepts and no stories or examples. If you have, it's very common. So <laughs> yeah, you could just type a yeah, Y. Quite, or yes. quite a few yeses coming in there. Okay, good. Yeah, it's just like we see other people do it, so we do it, but it's really not the best way to engage people. So if you wanna stand out at meetings and get people to you know, buy into your ideas, add more narrative elements to how you speak. And, and so that's kind of our focus here today. Now, here's a brain scan of a person listening to concepts versus stories. I thought this was interesting. Our brains are hardwired for stories in a way that they're not hardwired for facts. And so you see that the brain lights up a lot more. For example, before the printing press, stories were the way that knowledge, of course, was handed down through the generation. So as soon as people start hearing a story, their whole brain chemistry changes. And this brain scan just shows how more of the brain lights up. So you really increase engagement, retention of the information and help people more deeply understand your message. So whenever you communicate in story form, people do tend to remember remember it sometimes for years to come. I've been a speaker for probably 23 years or more and people come up to me all the time saying they remember my face and the story I told. They said, oh, you told that story about being on the roller coaster. They don't remember my name or the topic or any facts or stats about my presentation because names and titles are generally stored in the short-term memory and stories are in the long-term memory. And stories also appeal to a wide variety of learning styles, whether you're auditory, kinesthetic, read, write, sentient is a type of learning style. So uh, they appeal to all those styles all at once. So type yes into the chat if you actually already use stories in a workplace or business setting to get your point across. I'm sure some of you do, so I just be curious uh, to <laughs> type yes if that's true for you. And they can be short stories, like little anecdotes, you know, long kind of examples, case studies, that kind of thing. So I'm sure yeah. you do. Yeah, we're There's getting some a yeses. A couple of yeses, but less than, uh, than the previous rounds. Okay, good to know. Yeah, so I just think the more you do it, the more you stand out in business. And it's not that hard to add <laughs> to your presentation. So here's... 
a number that I'll ask you to type in. Which situations have you ever used stories? So you just type the number corresponding to that particular situation, like a job interview. So you're talking about you know, something that happened, like a challenge you overcame at a previous job. So think about that if you've ever done that. You would type one. Uh, you would type two if you've ever had to pitch your idea at a meeting and you decided to throw in a story like a case study a user example, that kind of thing. So you could type two there. Type three if you've ever done it, if you had to sell something to a potential customer where you talked about how you know, a, a customer now is using uh, your product or service and really had a lot of benefits from it. Uh, number four might be a networking event. You know how people say, so what do you do? And then instead of giving them a big sort of boring list of facts about yourself you actually tell a little story like you might start with oh you know how people find you know this problem well I help solve that problem so maybe you've done that and that would be number four number five would be giving a live or online presentation like this kind of if you've ever led a webinar like this or led an online meeting or you had to stand up and speak a uh, kind of a formal presentation that would be number five and number six is in social media profiles so some people like seeing a linkedin profile instead of well they'll list a bunch of facts about themselves but then they'll also put a story of how they helped somebody solve a problem right so just uh, put your number in uh, it could be many numbers, right? Maybe you do many, or if you don't do any of this, then don't feel, <laughs> you don't need to, you could put zero. <laughs> but uh, see what we get there. Or yeah, not that many people have, have been doing that. Or maybe you don't remember, that can also be true. <laughs> so here's our agenda. So we're going to talk about the benefits of using stories. I've talked about a few, but if I'm going to ask if you have some, you know, as a listener that you've noticed, uh, how to choose stories to tell. So, you know, a lot of people think, well, I, I don't want to, you know, choose the wrong story. So we'll talk about that definition of a story. A lot of people think they're telling a story when they're not telling a story. It's just a list of chronological events. So we'll talk about what it means. And comparisons and examples are forms of stories, and they engage the brain a lot more than facts and stats. So we'll talk about that. Uh, how to use it in a pitch, so an example. How to use it in a story in an interview. I'll give you an example there. And crafting a personal story to tell. Now, these are useful, say, in a job interview, or if you are giving a formal presentation or you're a team lead on something and people want to know a bit about who you are, it builds the like, know, and trust factor. Uh, of course, in any kind of sales situation, that's useful. And, and how important it is to have some kind of structure to your story, because if there's no structure, then that's when you get like a boring story right <laughs> and then delivery do's and don'ts and then just a, a few further resources for those of you who want more so what are some benefits of using stories versus facts and concepts feel free to add ideas to the chat if something comes up we've talked about a few so for example it's a way as we said to build engagement it makes you more memorable you will stand out if it's a job interview or if you know you're one of several people standing at a meeting giving a presentation people will wake up and stop texting uh, because you're talking in story form it builds rapport more quickly with strangers so always kind of fun to throw a little anecdote in there if you're talking to a stranger suddenly and you want to get to know them quickly. It can help you explain complex information more quickly, which is really useful. And a personal story can act as a resume that makes you stand out from your competition, as we kind of talked about. Now, if you look at a lot of the great leaders <laughs> in the world who speak, storytelling does set these particular business leaders apart. Steve Jobs, Sheryl Sandberg, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk. If you watch their presentation, you see they're full of stories. And if you watch any kind of TED talk before, the ones that do really well are full of stories. So it just goes to show, you know, those who want to stand out from the competition know this secret, this trick. Now, just a little bit of background about me so you understand uh, who I am. Uh, I was actually back in university hired by a training company to lead youth leadership events. So they actually trained me to engage up to 4,000 people at one time and often by using 
stories was the way they taught me. So I've been doing this a long time. And I actually went on to study acting, playwriting, screenplay writing, novel writing. So I was doing that on the side. So really I had a strong understanding of story. And at the same time, I started leading organizational training programs. I was doing some graduate work in uh, uh, OD and speaking on change leadership. And I noticed that the more stories I told, <laughs> the more I got hired. And it was the stories that people loved and remembered. And I wasn't just using stories during live presentations, but on the phone with potential clients and in my social media profiles and in my business books. And it made me stand out from the competition. Often I was asked to speak an event over like a president of a company or a president of a nation. <laughs> or a best-selling author, just because they knew that I would keep people more engaged because of the story element. So, and so much of what you see in business is really boring and people really appreciate it when you can just add like one story that supports the point you're trying to make. Now, about 12 years ago, people started asking me to help them create like a brand story for their business or to tell stories during pitches, live and online presentations. And I've been doing that ever since. Now our company, Mind Story Academy, does all that for people. And uh, it's sort of an interesting and weird career choice. And so you might be, I'm gonna be asking you a little bit later on, what made you choose your career direction? Cause this might be useful to turn into a story. So for me, when I was about 17 years old, I was a banquet waitress at a university conference center. And I loved this job because I got to see conference speakers when most teenagers don't get the chance to do that. And one event in particular really changed the course of my life. The conference was about solving the problems with the environment. So there I am, I'm, I'm having to wear this scratchy polyester black and white uniform. I'm at the back of the room with the white nursing shoes on available to pour coffee for anyone who wants it. And I'm at this particular event and most of the speakers are like activists or politicians. And the activists are pointing figures at government or corporations, blaming them for polluting the environment. Or they're the politicians making what others consider to be false promises to fix the problems. Now, the final speaker is a woman, and I never actually seen a woman speaker before, and her name is Dr. Helen Caldicott, and she's this tiny woman, shy. She stands behind this lectern, and she's just looking down, reading notes. So she's doing all the things you're not supposed to do if you're a speaker, but she's got this book and documentary called If You Love This Planet. Now, nobody's ever heard of her, so some people start leaving. But she starts with, you know, we can tax polluters and accuse politicians of lying, but that puts us at war with each other. My team and I have put together community action guides to clean up the environment at the grassroots level, and it's very easy to get started. So then she starts telling stories of how these guys are making a difference, like some in big communities, some in small communities around the world. They're very engaging stories. So people stop, turn around, start coming back to the room, I notice. And she's suggesting that we take collective responsibility for what's happening and to get into action together. And, and it, you could hear a pin drop, like I'm watching people listening to her, right? People are transfixed, mouths are hanging open. She's... And after she's done, there's like this feeding frenzy. People rush to her and want to buy her documentary film, her book, fund her project, invite her to speak, volunteer for her organization. And she was a bad speaker, actually, but she was telling stories. So it woke people up. It was interesting. And that day I decided to want to do some somehow something like that. And literally that one experience of seeing her speak altered like a thousand decisions I've made since that day. So even though she wasn't technically good as a powerful orator, her stories made her rise above the crowd and really magnetize people to her message and best yet to take action on her message. And so that's what stories can do in a really potent kind of way. So uh, you might be asking, how do you decide what kind of story to tell? Well, that really depends on your situation and your goals. So it's, so think about that for yourself. If you've got something coming up where you think, oh yeah, maybe I could throw in a story and I listed a bunch of situations. So think about that. Just get clear on your desired outcomes first. And so there's just basically four questions like, what is your role? 
who are your listeners, how do you want them to respond, and what's in it for them to listen. And as soon as you know all that, it, it starts to become more clear what kind of story to tell. So here's an example. Say it's a you know job applicant, <laughs> is, uh, and who's listening is the project team leader and maybe someone from human resources. How? Well, you want them to hire you, and what by hiring you, their project will be more likely to finish on time and on budget and be highly usable. So that's just a, a quick example. Now, a storytelling definition is important. As I said, some people think they're telling a story when they're not. So a storytelling definition is narrative as opposed to logical explanation of concepts. So think about sitting around the dinner table at night <laughs> with your family, and somebody says, oh, what happened today? And you start telling a story of how you know, we got stuck in traffic and you went in the wrong direction. And, you know, that's a story, right? We often speak in narrative form actually a lot. And then we get into business and we stop doing it. It's really interesting. So a second definition is linked events that unfold over time with enough what's called psychological realism to create narrative transport. Now, what that means is if you've ever watched a movie and somebody's creeping through a dark house at night and there's strange sounds and you start feeling nervous on behalf of the actor in the film, the director is happy, they've created narrative transport in their listener. You start to become almost emotionally invested in the person in the story. So that. So that's what you want to go for. And three interactions of characters who possess minds and have motivations. So this could be people, but you know, if you've got kids and you've probably seen, you know, cartoon characters that are a square and a block and a triangle interacting, well, people get engaged by that, even though they're not people. So so let's think of about elevator speech comparison. So those are useful, say, if you're, you know, at some kind of event, someone says, So what do you do? So let's say here's one that's not a story form that people think is a story form. Somebody might say, well, I have a master's degree from Caltech and have worked with big companies like Enterprise Limited and TRT Industries, helping them implement fully integrated CRM systems that are compatible with all major database applications utilized by Fortune 500 uh, companies. So that is often the kind of thing someone will say in an elevator speech, but it's not a story and it doesn't tend to engage people as much as say this, it, which is a benefit focused story. I have eight years of experience helping large corporations like yours effectively use their customer information to drive repeat sales and reduce customer turnover. When I started at Enterprise Limited, their customer information was disorganized. People in different departments couldn't share it easily. Each time a customer called, they had to give all the same information and this made it frustrating and so turnover was high. After my team designed and implemented the new CRM system, sales increased by 21%. So it takes a little longer to say, but people will be generally more engaged. So think of a recent um, you know, status update. You gave it a meeting or an interview you did, or you pitched an idea, or actually if you did a formal presentation or had a sales conversation. So what, uh, so just think about this question. Did any part of it seem unengaging? Right? Like you can tell when you're talking to people, they seem interested and all of a sudden they start to glaze over. Right? So it's good if you see people start to glaze over, uh, then do this little tactic. So think through any part of your this upcoming or past situation and see if you can add this little formula, which is fact plus meaning plus story. <laughs> so here's an example. So it's a hiring example. Say you want to hire someone and you're talking to them. So the fact you might say is our company just expanded to 10 countries around the world. So great. <laughs> you know, what does that mean for the person, right? So then you just kind of want to add in what that means. So our company is growing rapidly. So there's great opportunities for you to advance quickly, to add your creative ideas, to travel all over the world and meet people from many uh, countries. Sorry. <laughs> bit too far. And 
Then it's also useful to add like a quick example of what that looked like. So he says, for example, Travis is one of our new managers hired last year. He was able to move from northern Canada with his family to our office in Malta, which has a great climate and an international school his kids love. He was originally hired as a developer, but he's had so many great ideas for attracting good people that we promoted him to head of recruitment too, which he loves. Now, obviously, you pick a story that you think will... <laughs> you know, make the person who's listening more interested, open their minds more to what you're proposing. So type yes if you ever tell someone else's story, for example, another person's success story or an anecdote about a famous person or a cautionary tale about an end user. Like chances are you have and you just forgot that you did. So, so telling other people's stories is, you know, one thing to think about and then telling a personal story is another kind of way to think about it. And some people use you know, myths and legends or a scene from a movie even if it really highlights the point they're trying to make or something that happened to, you know, a, a president or the prime minister of your country or whatever. So, you know, think about that, something that's been in the news. You can also use that because again, it does engage people in the same way. So here's another example with Dropbox, right? If you were to talk about Dropbox with just facts, you'd say Dropbox is a file hosting service that offers cloud storage, file synchronization, personal cloud, and client software. So unless you're a cloud specialist, that would be sort of boring, right? So what does that mean? Well, that means you have a special folder on your computer that's synchronized to whatever other devices you need, other laptops or tablets. No more moving files from one device to another using like a hard drive or sending it via email. And you can share what's in the folders with colleagues and say service providers. So example, one client, Mike, just wrote us saying he can now hire a video editor who is excellent at much more affordable rate. Video editors in his city were charging like $125 per hour and he needed to constantly be dropping off and picking up a two terabyte hard drive to this guy's office. Now he can share large video files via Dropbox with an offshore editor who's half the price. Now, what about pitches? You know, I sometimes sit in the audience or help judge pitches, people pitching their tech company or their their idea, trying to get some investors or supporters or interest. So this was a really interesting one that totally stood out from all the other ones because it started like this. It was Blaze Bioscience. A neurosurgeon stands over a 12-year-old cancer patient in the operating room, scalpel in hand. It is unclear exactly which cells in the child's brain are part of the cancerous tumor and which are healthy. Does the surgeon choose to remove all suspicious tissue or play it safe by removing less? With the Blaze Bioscience tumor paint, Surgeons can see cancerous tissue during the operation, sparing them from having to choose between going too far and not far enough. So think about that for yourself. You have to pitch any idea. Can you take people there in the moment with somebody getting a solution that they wouldn't get if they didn't have what you're pitching about. That's a really good way to do it. Here's a job interview story example. My team was finishing up an update report for the board of directors. So he's talking about a past company he worked for, right? Two nights before the meeting, I discovered new groundbreaking information that made me realize the project needed to go in a totally new direction if we're going to stay competitive. I called an emergency meeting of the team. We all agreed we needed to redo the report. I reorganized all our schedules to ensure we could hammer out the report in time for the board meeting. We got it done the night before the meeting and I presented it the next day and got rave reviews. So for some reason, if you tell a story, if you're trying to you know, get a promotion or a job interview, people don't think you're bragging, which is good. It's just the facts. You told the facts about what happened and it makes it gives you credibility, right? Now, stories and anecdotes for formal presentations uh, are really useful, live or online, kind of like what I've been doing here. So think about how you can add sort of more examples and stories if you do any of that kind of a thing. Now, 
the fun thing to do is if you know your audience quite well and you know something they're into, you can actually even type in something they're interested in or the topic you're talking about plus story into Google and you'll find, you know, public domain stories and you can use them if you like them and if they haven't been told a million times before, or you can actually type in the word anecdote. And anecdote is just like a short form story that's usually funny. And sometimes those are good things to start uh, a presentation off with. So I told a little anecdote at the beginning when I talked about this meeting where everybody talked to the screen, right? That would be like an anecdote kind of thing. So now this was me telling a situation that I witnessed, but I was there. A personal story is something that happened to you. So, and you can use these to motivate a team. And I'll show you an example of that, of how I used it to motivate a, a team of salespeople. Um, it can build your credibility. If they know something about you, it can en enhance rapport with your listeners, as I talked about. It can teach your subject more deeply because when people learn something, from what's called a metaphor narrative perspective, it actually goes more deeply into the brain and their brain kind of sorts out the, the useful information for them. And this is especially true if it's sort of a complex thing you're trying to teach to people and people are in different stages of learning, right? And it will appeal to a variety of learning styles as I talked about. So, so stories are kind of the uni universal way to pull in a lot of different kinds of people who are at different stages of understanding of what you're talking about. Now, what often people say to me is, well, I can't think of any stories to tell. You know, I haven't climbed Mount Everest or solved world hunger. <laughs> so <laughs> you don't have to have had like amazingly huge things happen to you. Often it's the little things in life that are the most interesting and the most relatable to people. So I'll be asking you to think about that for yourself, if there is a situation which you think maybe a personal story might be useful and, you know, people sometimes use this also if they have to speak at a funeral or a, or a wedding or something. So how to find a personal story to tell is to look for story triggers. So what's a story trigger? Well, it's one of four things. So look in your life. So think about that now and make a note if something comes to mind, a challenge you overcame. Sorry, that should be a challenge you overcame, not a challenge you overcame. An inner dilemma you finally resolved. So you want to look for sort of crossroads in your life where you took a new direction, right? So an inner dilemma you finally resolved or a new direction you took. A conflict you resolved with another person or group. And the fourth one is a great discovery you made. So anything in your life where a lot of things changed, you know, it could be the birth of a child, it could be getting married, it could be getting a new job, it could be taking on a new project, it could be ending a big project. It could be a time, yeah, you overcame this huge challenge at work, you know, against all odds and triumphed, right? You wanna tell a story with a triumph at the end if you're gonna use it in business to teach. Now. You can tell a cautionary tale too, and that that is, you know, something you did and it was a mistake and things went badly, so don't do that, right? That is a way to do it. But um, if you're trying to do anything that opens minds to your ideas, you don't want to tell them about how something didn't work out and it still doesn't work out and never will, right? You just want to make sure that it's got a happy ending to the story, right? So. Here's the place, one place to look if if you can't think of anything. So to zero in is where are you in life are you already adventurous? <laughs> so where you take risks, like for some people, a lot of people don't like public speaking, for example, but maybe you do it and you're fine with it, right? So it would be public speaking maybe as an area you've overcome some of the initial challenges that a lot of people have, or maybe networking, you're just really amazing at networking. Um, so you want to think of where do you take risks when others, a lot of others are more nervous about doing that? Where are you more willing to get uncomfortable? And it could be, you know, all kinds of areas. So just to give you some ideas, you know, maybe you playing sports is an area for you or ballroom dance or renovating your home or parenting or cooking or in your love life or fashion or, uh, as I said, speaking, networking, or maybe you're one of those people that gets up in front of the room and sings or plays a musical instrument, right? Or you go horseback riding or you've done some sort of thrill sport, you know, um, 
So think about that for yourself and just make a note of one of those. You don't have to be like a total expert in it, but you've achieved some level of proficiency in it. So that means somewhere around that experience, you've had a challenge you overcame story. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's what we're looking for here. So I'll give you uh, an example. So I was always into outdoor recreation because I grew up in Canada. And so there's lots of beautiful outdoor recreation. I was a tomboy. I, you know, I was a girl that liked to climb trees. My family went camping all the time. And I did a high school program where instead of sitting in the classroom we went snow camping and rock climbing and canoeing and uh, sailing and all kinds of stuff like that so that's what we did every day and so it was very comfortable for me so as an adult when I became adult and I was working for a training and consulting firm and they said hey some of us are going to go white water rafting as a, as a company do you want to come now um, not everyone wanted to go on this trip because, you know, white water rafting scares some people. But I thought to myself, heck, I'm fine with outdoor rec. I'd never done white water rafting, but I thought it couldn't be too hard, right? So I said yes. But of course, when I got there, I found out they didn't want to stay in the raft. They wanted to go down in inner tubes. So these are the inner part of a truck, inner tubes, and uh, the whole way down the river. Now, this was a river in southern Oregon called the Rogue River, and it gets its name for a reason. The word rogue means wild, right? And so, you know, if you're going down the inner tube in, say, a uh, a, a class one river or class two river, it's nice and smooth like this, but the rogue was what's called a class four river, which meant that there was a lot of white water and hidden rocks. So you're going down that in an inner tube. So you have to get very well suited, I should say. It's this, uh, you know, I look like the creature from the Black Lagoon here. This is where you're basically in this very thick wetsuit to protect your backside from getting scratched up. You have uh, running shoes on to push off the rocks and your life vest to keep you above the water. And then you have these webbed gloves so that you can paddle away from rocks and escape death, basically. <laughs> so we have this river guide named Ben who tells us there are three ways down the river. You can stay on the raft with the oarsman, which he liked the idea of, or you can walk your tube along the shoreline during the white water, which again, he was very happy for us to do, or you can go down in the tube. Now, he was a little worried about people going down the tube because it's a liability hazard for him and his company, right? Now, if you're gonna go down the tube, he says he wanted to warn us about some really important things. For example, you had to know about what's an un un unobstructed flow of water as opposed to where there might be rocks or a ledge, which means like a waterfall. And he also wanted us to know about back eddies where you could be pulled into a whirlpool on the side of the river and you would be stuck going around and around in circles. And if any of you have ever been on a river trip, you know about those and you can get stuck there. Now, the worst type of whirlpools are actually called... Um, hydraulic whirlpools and we had one on our river called the coffee pot and this is a hole underwater that you can't see when you're going over the top of the water and it creates this downward spiral to anything on the top of the water so it's like water going down a drain and um, the coffee pot for example could pull you underwater and hold you under there longer than you could hold your breath and it could be tricky to get out so he said to us, if that happens to you, listen to the wisdom of the river. And I thought, well, what the heck does that mean? But he moved on to another topic and I didn't get a chance to ask. So off we go. We're in the river in a quiet part and I'm doing OK. And um, but then I see a number of people paddle over to the shore and get out of the water. Apparently, they're going to walk their tubes along the edge of the river because we're coming to a wild part of the river called Mule Creek Canyon, which is beautiful. And it's these high rock walls that make the water speed up. So it's where the rapids can go up to class five. Now, I've heard tales that if you've tubed the canyon you're in a league all your own and it's a it's a status symbol right so i look and I, and all the people left in the river are the daredevils all the men all the women have gone out of the river and i think um 
I'll do it anyways. <laughs> it can't be that hard. And I see the first man go round the bend and we can hear these blood curdling screams from him, you know, echoing through the canyon. So I think, oh gosh, if he's freaking out, I should probably get out. So I start paddling to the shoreline. Now, one of the other guys who's in the water says to me, yeah, you better get out of the water. It's not for women. Now, he could have said anything else to me and I would have still gotten out of the water, but because he said it's not for women to do, it somehow triggered me because, you know, I considered myself a tomboy. I didn't let being a woman or a girl stop me from doing these kind of things. So, you know, it went against my self image here. So now I had to do it. Um, and so he goes off down the river. I hear him kind of freaking out, but now I'm stuck in a back eddy and I can't actually get into the river and I can't get out of the river. I'm stuck going around and around, stuck in the reeds. And as I'm stuck in the reeds, the last of the river guides goes by. Now there were four rafts spaced out amongst all the inner tubers so that the last raft is behind the last inner tuber. And to rescue you in case you need it. Now he's gone. And so I had several reasons to get <laughs> out of the river. I'd never done it before. Everybody had gone ahead and it was really hard to get back in the river. So I had to really want this, but I thought I really want the excitement of having say, said I tubed the canyon uh, instead of just walked it. So I pushed really hard and I grabbed branches and, and pulled myself really hard back out into the river, the white water. And I start getting pulled downstream into the intense rapids. Now my heart is pumping like crazy. Adrenaline is coursing through my veins. I have my webbed gloves. I'm paddling as hard as I can to slow down, but it's not helping. And I see the last of the rafts up ahead, and it's one of the river guides, Dwayne, the last river guide. Now, on the raft with him is a woman named Amy, and she didn't even want to be on the river trip. She just came because of her boyfriend, one of the daredevils in the group. She was just sitting there trying to look good throughout the trip. So she was wearing her Versace sandals and her polka dot sundress and her little sun hat. And she didn't want to walk along the shoreline for that part of the rabbits because she didn't have the right footwear. And she kept taking off her life jacket because it didn't look good with her outfit. So it's Amy and Dwayne heading down the most dangerous narrow passage of the river. And he looks behind me and he sees me about 100 meters upstream. And he's clearly shouting at me, but I can't hear him. And he's pointing to the other side of the river that I am on, as if to say I was on the dangerous side of the river and I better get over. So I start paddling like crazy, trying to get traction, but I can't because the water's moving too fast. Now, Dwayne and Amy are heading for the edge of what looks like a waterfall. And I watch as the whole raft tips over this waterfall and goes so high up that it flips over completely. So literally all the luggage, all the gear falls into the water. Amy and Dwayne are now in the white water flailing around in there. And she doesn't have a life vest, so she's holding on to luggage. And this very gigantic spill of water comes in my direction, which causes a swell that pushes me over to even more to the dangerous side of the river. And I go over what looks like an even steeper waterfall. I go over it, and I later find out I land right on top of the coffee pot that hydraulic whirlpool. So I instantly get pulled down underwater, like water going down a drain. And it pulls me underwater. Now the sound suddenly becomes muffled. I went from intense sound of white water to underwater sounds of bubbles. And I'm paddling and kicking to try to get out, but I just keep getting pulled deeper underwater and I'm losing my breath. I can't hold on anymore. I'm completely submerged. And all I can hear are these muffled sounds of the rapids. I don't know if you've ever experienced something like that where you could die, but you start having weird thoughts. And when I was almost out of breath, I heard this voice say, stop fighting. And I thought, oh, that doesn't sound like my voice. It was this kind of calm, wise sounding voice. So I thought to myself, maybe that's the wisdom of the river that the guide was talking about. But then I thought, if I stop fighting, I'm going to be pushed down even deeper. So that doesn't seem like a good idea. 
But then all of a sudden, I really, I was going to lose my breath any moment. So I thought, okay, I have nothing to lose here. I'm going to completely relax my body. And that's what I did. I stopped fighting and I completely let go. And the spiral of the water pushed me down, 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 as I suspected, all the way to the bottom of the river. I could actually feel the rock at the bottom of the river under me. But then, because I had nowhere else to go, the, the twirling force spit me out of the water. I literally projectiled out of the river like flipper with my tube going in one direction and me going in the other. And now I'm getting pulled down the river <laughs> with no inner tube, but I can breathe now. I'm above the water and my life jacket is keeping my head above the water, which is great. And I'm just kicking off the rocks like I've been told to do and staying as fully present as possible. And I see up ahead, poor Amy in her cute dress and sandals with no life jacket and the river guide helping her hold on to the luggage. They're just trying to stay afloat. And we all come around the bend to a quiet area of the river where people are pulling ashore and they see us all coming around just you know, in the white water instead of our raft and tubes. And they start cheering for us because obviously we survived and they pull us out of the river and I'm coughing up river water and they're, you know, just coming over to see whether we're okay. And the guy <laughs> that told me it's not for women to go on this Mule Creek Canyon came up to me and he said, you tube the canyon, way to go. And he's giving me a fist bump and everyone's high-fiving me. And I'm part of this gang now that has tubed the canyon. And I feel great that I made that choice. And Amy's boyfriend rushes over to her. She's shaken, but she's all right. She actually looks exhilarated. Her eyes are more alive than ever. They hug each other. She doesn't want to fly home like he was afraid. And um, she wanted to stay on the river and get down and dirty with the rest of us, get into the ugly wetsuit and, <laughs> and really be part of the river with us. And so that was amazing for her. And the irony was that the people who hiked along the side of the river all got poison oak. So the irony was that all paths down the river had their challenges. And I was so glad I chose the most exciting route for me, which was to go down in my tube because it really paid off. And after getting home, I noticed how that river trip story changed other parts of my life. For example, I noticed that a lifetime habit of being indecisive kind of lifted. And there's that saying, decide to decide instead of getting caught in the back eddies of life. And to just pick the most exciting goal, the most exciting you know, vision for you in your life. And, and, and also, if you ever get into an intense challenge, to not fight it, but to let go and learn from the situation, even if it feels counterintuitive, because by allowing myself to go more deeply into the challenge, often it shows me the lesson I'm meant to learn and spits me back out into safety again. So this river trip is deeply imbued in my memory, not only because it was an intense experience, but because I often tell the story of what I learned from it. And I'm re-hypnotizing myself and embedding and imprinting the lessons learned more deeply. And I can use a story like that in many situations. And I originally told that story to a group of sales um, people who were part of a independent distributors group and they were just too afraid to pick up the phone and because he didn't like the rejection and somehow me telling that story got people feeling more courageous to go after their goals to be more goal oriented than obstacle oriented and so it's that's the interesting phenomenon about stories is that people will take from it what they need and other people took different things like to be more decisive and for other people it was something else right so you never know and that's why stories can appeal to a lot of different people for a lot of different reasons. So think about that for your area of adventure. If you want to think of a personal story you might want to tell, and uh, you can see how it might be applicable to some situation you have coming up. Now, here's a question for you. What makes a story relatable? And so to think about that for yourself, and if any idea comes to mind, you can you know type it into the chat. I'd just be interested to hear. Um, now, while I was considering this particular question, I saw this website, maybe you've seen something like this, it was called the six most rewatched movies of all time. 
so <laughs> apparently there's a list of movies that people watch over and over and over again. So think about that for yourself. What movies have you seen more than once? Now, obviously there's many movies that we would never see again, but Star Wars is on that list, as you can see from the image here, but see if you can think of any of the others that are in the top six. Feel free to type something into the chat if it occurs to you. So this was what was on the list. Star Wars, The Wizard of Oz, The Matrix, Groundhog's Day, Gone with the Wind, Titanic. Who would have thought? Right. And and probably the one you thought of is on there too. It's a fairly big list. But so here's your here's my question for you is why? <laughs> why do those why do people rewatch those movies as opposed to others? Well, some of you may have heard of the hero's journey, which was mapped out by myth expert Joseph Campbell. He studied myths and stories in all cultures of all time in history and found that humans basically tell the same kind of story to themselves at the very core. And when stories are told like this, in this structure, they program people, like subconsciously program people for good or bad, by the way. So it's a very important what kinds of stories you consume and tell because they will, as I've said before, open people's minds to new possibilities in great ways or make them not go in a certain direction. So you have to think about that. And it's not to say that a good story doesn't include negativity or conflict or struggle, that's normal. But stories that include the hero's journey, this structure here, as you can see, where uh, number one, it's like the ordinary world, and there's this call to change is number two. And then usually there's this refusing the call. And then the four is the meeting, the mentor. Five is the crossing the line. Six is facing trials and enemies. So just think about, you know, Lord of the Rings, you can see this structure. Um, Number seven is facing the darkness. Number eight is the journey back to the ordinary world with a new perspective. And then number 10 is you return with the wisdom and the resilience to tell others. And and I really think that being a business communicator is a form of, you know, a, a hero's journey. And so, and we all are living these hero's journeys all through our life as we're, if you're managing people or you're handling a very complex project, you're probably going through these stages unless you get stuck in which you don't make it through right to number 10. But it's really useful to think about that when I consider what's called your short ascension story. And you might have many um, that you might use in different situations, but there's a short version of this that I created. And part of that is to add your, what I call your big why. And this is useful, say, if you want to add something to your LinkedIn profile or a company profile as to why you do what you do um, or any kind of job interview or just a, trying to get a promotion, right? Why, why do you want to do this? People want to know. And, you know, if you were to look at Google Analytics of which page on your, on your website or your company website that most people look at, more than any other page, what do you think it is? Now, most people think it's the home page, but that's not true. It's actually the about page because people want to know what you do, how you do it, but more importantly, they want to know why you do it. <laughs> so what's your mission, vision, values? People are looking for a values match, right? And so that's, stories can do that. Um, heroes journey stories uh, help you communicate to people your mission, your vision, your why, why you want to be doing whatever it is that you're communicating about, and the universal human values that you're living by that they might relate to. And that's really important to people, maybe not consciously, but unconsciously. So be thinking about that if you share any kind of personal story, if you can put in your values into that. And and as I said, you know, adding it to social media so people kind of get a sense of who you are more at the core level of values. Now, um, so just think about that for yourself right now. Jot down a few notes if you want to. What is your why? <laughs> a lot of people, they don't really think of this. So, for example, what, why this role that you're in? 
what's important to you about it, as opposed to all the other roles you could have in your work life, why have you chosen this one, right? There must be some core underlying value that drove you, right? Or it could be why this organization or company that you work with, or if you have your own business, why this particular business, you know, what is it as opposed to all the other ones that you could be part of, right? What was it? And again, it's usually a values word, right? That you, you know, that has good culture. People are friendly. People get along. There, there's this creativity and innovation that's supported. Um, I like the people, right? People say things like that all the time. Or I get, you know, it's challenging my, you know, capacity to solve complex problems, that kind of thing. And then the third way to look at it is what is your ultimate vision that this role is helping you achieve, right? So sometimes people are doing things because, oh, it allows me to live in this certain country or live in this certain neighborhood or provide the kind of income for my family that they want or do a hobby or something. So all those things are, are relevant. So just be thinking about that and see if anything comes to mind for you and see how you might throw that into a story. And just so you, I'll do a brief example of what I mean by a story structure that people are attracted to. So if you've ever told a, a story around the dinner table and people seem interested, don't think that that necessarily makes a good story because usually stories around the dinner table aren't structured. They kind of are a bit too long winded or people like it because they know you, right? But if you're talking to people who don't know you, you do need to put it into a structure. So you start with um, the what I call the old status quo. So you set the platform of the ordinary world and then you tilt the platform, you throw off your center of, <laughs> of balance in some way, which is usually, as I talked about, conflict, challenge, change, decision, or discovery, something that sets you on a new path in life. A small new crossroads or a big one, it doesn't matter, both make for good stories. And then the consequences of that are the part three of the story structure. And the fourth uh, part of the structure is getting back to stability. And so this is where you have a transforming idea, which improves performance. And then you get this new platform, this new status quo. So this is useful if you wanted to tell a case study of somebody who's successfully using your product, your service, right? But it can also be a personal story of how you solved a problem and how you'd be good for a certain <laughs> job or how you've seen somebody else solve a problem in the past and how you would like to propose that for a project you're working on now, right? So I'll just use this structure. I'll just, uh, one of the reasons I told you the river trip story is so that I could describe <laughs> this particular structure very briefly here. So to, the way I set the platform is uh, it's just by saying I was comfortable doing outdoor recreation and that I'd been a tomboy growing up. And also uh, I set up that I, what it was like being on the river, how you have to dress, what the dangers are, what is important to understand when there are hazards. And so you want to do that in your story. What do people need to know so that the rest of the story makes sense? So that's all you do in number one. So in part two, what you do is you tilt the platform. So this is where you look for conflicts, challenge, change, decision, discoveries. So it's when your ordinary world gets turned upside down. So in my case on the river, it was deciding to go down this dangerous part of the river, the Mule Creek Canyon, uh, even when the river guide and all the other tubers had gone past me, right? So that's all you do for number two. So think about that for your story. Now, number three is simply the consequences of what happens by going off in this new direction. And so, you know, of making that decision of this thing happening to you. Well, I, you know, for, in my case, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm on the dangerous side of the river and the river guide is trying to point me over to the other side of the river, but it's too late. I can't get traction. I go over this mini waterfall and land into the coffee pot, the hydraulic whirlpool. And of course, um, I get pulled underwater as I suggested, uh, as they told me that would happen. Now, so then you wanna have a part of your story where you get back to stability. And so what happened with me was I had the transforming idea that what, um, from you know the listening to the wisdom of the river, which was to let go. 
So going against my <laughs> better judgment, I did that. And then I ended up getting spit out of the river back to safety. And so then the, the final part is the new platform, the new status quo, how you changed, what's different in the world as a result of you going through this experience. And so I described, you know, getting pulled ashore and how I felt like I was a wiser, more resilient kind of person and how I've been able to use that story to help people who need that courage and resilience to move forward. So uh, I just want to add in some few delivery do's and don'ts, especially if you're doing sort of a stand up in front of the room kind of thing, is you just don't want to wing it and you don't want to apologize for yourself. Like, oh, I, I don't know if I'll really remember this story. And, um, you know, you've just sort of told it once and you haven't rehearsed it. Don't do that. <laughs> and don't race through really, really fast. Make sure you pause occasionally. And uh, don't be disconnected from it, right? So be connected to, like, be in the story as you tell it. And don't use too many adjectives, you know, where you're describing things too much. Stick to the facts. So that leads us to the do's, which are just plan, edit, and rehearse it a bit if you're going to use it in a business setting. And make sure you pause. You modulate your voice a bit, a little quiet, a little bit more intense sometimes and that you you really f go into the story. Like when I was telling that river trip story, I'm in the story, I'm feeling it, right? <laughs> I'm feeling the adrenaline, right? Um, and let the facts speak for themselves. So you just tell the facts because people interpret stories in different ways. So if you kind of tell people how they should feel about the story, it's not as effective. And then just deliver it with as much presence as possible and, you know, giving it your, <laughs> I always say, especially if you're going to do it in a high pressure situation, like you're pitching yourself to decision makers. And if you don't do well, it's not good, right? That's when the survival brain gets triggered and people stop, start forgetting what they want to say. And they start to stumble and say, oh, well, you know, and um, <laughs> and they look like a deer in the headlights and they can't breathe very well. So you want to, if you memorize a story, not so that you sound stilted, but that you obviously know it in your bones, it's going to override the fight or flight response and you'll do well. And you can practice it by, say, doing it to your webcam. So um, just think about that. Now, I will say that one well-crafted story will pay you back 100 times. I've seen it happen over and over again. This <laughs> just nobody's really paying attention to a person's message and then they add a story and boom, everyone's attention changes and they become memorable. It builds their credibility, their rapport, they get into action, it's huge. So don't underestimate a little bit of effort. <laughs> we'll pay you off over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. So just some further resources, if you want to check out CarlaRieger.com, that's Carla with a C, Rieger spelled R-I-E-G-E-R.com, or our other website is MindStoryAcademy.com, and we have a whole section on free stuff, lots of free training and tools. We have online programs, group, and private coaching, so you can have a look at that. One thing in particular that we're doing this Sunday and next Wednesday is a masterclass online called Communicating with Stories. Seven Secrets to Being a Master Storyteller in Business Who Can Inspire and Motivate People to Action. A little bit would be a repeat of today, but there's a whole template that is a takeaway that you can use and uh, on a number of other tools that maybe you didn't get today. So if you want to check that out, that's carlarieger.com backslash stories. CarlaRieger.com backslash stories. You can go there and uh, check that out. So I will just end with this lovely old Chinese proverb. Tell me the facts and I'll forget. Give me an example and I'll remember. But tell me a story and I will be inspired to action. <laughs> so... Uh, I hope you got some useful tools you can use right away and to engage, inspire, and motivate people to action. Until next time, I'm Carla Rieger. Thank you for listening. All right. Thank you, Carla, for your presentation. And thanks for trying to inspire us to, uh, to action. So